simply the title of my teaching tonight is What You Should Do When Things Can't Get Any Worse. How many believe this is for you tonight already? Oh, well, I got the right message for the right crowd anyway so far, huh? What you should do when things can't get any worse. You're not going to like it, I'm going to tell you that. You may be excited right now and you, oh, praise. But you won't like it, I, I'm going to tell you. Um, not that you won't like me, you just won't like what God's going to say to you, perhaps in some respects. And, uh, and you say, well, Pastor Dave, you know, don't you like every time God speaks to you? Well, no. Because sometimes he tells me to do stuff, my flesh says, uh-uh. You know? Or I start to point to other Christians and say, well, why don't, why don't, why don't I got to change? And then you let them get away with it. See? I'm glad y'all don't do that, though, right? Good. Praise the Lord. I mean, you guys are more spiritual than I am. Y'all ought to be pastors, you know? It's evident. <clears throat> I had a real revelation in our home today. Gabe, my four and a half year old, most of you know Gabe's reputation and, and uh, demeaning and comes from Barb's side of the family. And uh, <clears throat> I came home today from the office and his head was soaking wet. You know, and, uh, and he's had a little bit of cold and stuff the last couple of days and fever and all and he's doing better. But come in the house and the kid's head is soaking wet. And He's been in the farming lately. Barbara had this wallpaper tray, you know, where she just wallpaper. And we put some potting soil in there and put some zucchini squash seeds in there. And Gabe has been fascinating every day. I mean, he goes out and literally prays over this thing, you know, and waters it every day. And, and now we pick zucchini for the first time today. And the other day we picked some green beans. And it's like, man, he's carrying his zucchini around. Like, you know, it, I, mean, he, I mean, every morning the kid runs out there and looks and checks his plants. And, uh, so that's been kind of the background of what's been going on in our house, real excitement for him, and just real intense in, in, in getting these things up and out. And, and, uh, and so I asked him, I said, Gabe, why is your head so wet? And he said, I want my hair to grow. <laughs> so he watered it. <laughs> and I asked, I said, what? And he, and he repeated it like, you idiot, I want my hair to grow, and I watered it. <laughs> like, where's your brain? You out to lunch, you know? I said, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, all right. Praise the Lord. And, uh, of course, then my eight-year-old is a real, real whiz, and she picks up on that kind of stuff. And his hair, when he got to the supper table, his hair was standing straight up right here. And she said, look, Gabe, your hair is growing up towards the light. <laughs> And he's going. I said, Chrissy, shut up. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm glad you have a normal household. We all have our cross to bear. Amen. Praise God. Isaiah chapter 54. Look with me at verse 1. And uh, really be taking on the whole chapter, I trust, tonight. What you should do when things can't get any worse. Let's pray first. Father, I pray revelation would come forth tonight beyond what I know and any scholarly abilities I have, Father, just from professional training, God, that, the word says that the, that the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. And, 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 Father, by your spirit's power, let it come and give life to your word tonight, life to your people. And let us not just look at it and see out of convenience like we're going to stop and get something that's going to pick us up and encourage us, but, Father, let us see what God would say to us as we wait as desiring to be obedient servants, servants ready to hear your word and your command, your command to us and go forth and do it under your lordship. In the name of Jesus, Spirit, come now and give life to me and life to this teaching, Father. Life to tired people as they hear it in Jesus' name. And I thank you. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. What you should do when things can't get any ver worse. Verse 1, shout for joy, O barren one, you who have borne no child, Break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud, you who have not travailed. For the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. Spare not. 
Lengthen your cords and strengthen your pegs, for you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your descendants will possess nations, and they will resettle the desolate cities. Verse 4, Fear not, for you will not be put to shame, neither feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced. But you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood, you'll remember no more, for your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. You feel it already? For the Lord has called you, like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth when she was reje rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In an outburst of anger I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. For this is like the days of Noah to me when I swore that the waters of Noah uh, should not flood the earth again. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you, nor will I rebuke you. For the mountains will, may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you and my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Can you say Amen. Skip down, if you would, please, with me to verse 14. In righteousness you will be established. You will be far from oppression, for you will not fear, and from terror, for it will not come near you. If anyone fiercely assails you, it will not be from me. Whoever assails you will fail because of you. Behold, I myself have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and brings out a weapon for its work. And I have created the destroyer to ruin for no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. And this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their vindication is from me, declares the Lord your God. Praise God. Just the reading of the word. Just, you're ready, aren't you? What you should do when things can't get any worse. Well, you do the opposite of what you feel, basically, is Isaiah's advice. Now, Isaiah is addressing his his prophecy to the nation of Israel that's been disobedient, rebellious, failed in their walk with God. <laughs> that doesn't apply to any of us, right? Uh, and so here, here they are, barren spiritually uh, because of their disobedience, because of their failing. That, that is the backdrop of what is happening in Isaiah 54. And yet there, there is a promise now through prophecy, as Isaiah speaks on God's behalf to the nation of Israel, yes, this is what is, but this is what God is going to do. Now, that's where you're at now, tonight. This is what is. We're very aware of that. But I want to turn you, if I can tonight, to what God is going to do. Amen? Let's don't be content with what's, what is happening. Let's say, God, give us a word. What are you going to do in my life and circumstances? Jesus, what are you going to do in this matter? on my behalf, to vindicate me. Amen? Well, first of all, we must look at what God wants us to do. Hmm. He says, first of all, what? What's the first phrase of the first verse? What, what translation has sing? Living Bible, NIV. King James has sing. Okay, New American Standard says shout. Okay, I should have dug that out. I didn't realize there was a difference there. But shout... Or sing. For what? Joy. And you see, we do just the opposite. We wait with our mouth open, hands raised for joy to hit us. Hmm. We come to church and expect pastor to walk by and inoculate us with joy. Here. Here's you some. You some. You some. And it doesn't happen. And we, what, what do we say? Well, service is not very anointed tonight. One thing's for clear, pastor's not prayed up, that's for sure. If he was prayed up, I'd be feeling the Holy Ghost by now. Well, it's too bad David Sharp don't pray more and get better song lists, you know what I mean? Get more anointing on them worse. Don't we? We're guilty of that, aren't we? But he's saying if you want joy, you must shout and sing for it. Now, why is shouting and singing so critical to God? Because shouting and singing is in spite of what's going on. 
Listen, if you're going to sit around and wait for Satan to give you something to smile about and have joy about, you've got a long wait on your hands. <laughs> if you're going to wait around for your circumstances to make you happy, you may wait a long time before a, a smile cracks across your face. Amen? And meanwhile, you, you're going to look pruny to a lot of unbelievers and tell them they ought to get saved and get what you got, and they say, no, thank you. I'll keep the joy of the bottle, you know. You keep your kind of joy. Keep that to yourself. You see, in the battles of the Old Testament, it was the singers that were put out there first. <laughs> I don't know if I want to be singing in those days. It was those carrying the banners of victory and the names of God on the banners that were thrust out there first. And it says they began to sing. What were they singing? They were singing praises to God, looking back to what God had done. If you're going to live by what is happening now, friend, your spiritual walk will be disastrous. Because you're living by what's happening, which will then instigate what you feel and your emotions, and your whole spiritual walk is going to go by what's happening now and what I feel like is about what's happening now. Are you with me? You with me? Singing and shouting for joy with these armies of God in Israel was they would look not at what's happening now, not what the enemies out there camped around the city, but they would look back at what God has done. They would begin to sing like Miriam who, when the Red Sea was parted. They would begin to sing about the plagues of what God did. They began to sing about manna falling from heaven. They began to sing about what God had done and began to give praise to God as what God had already done and established himself in relationship and covenant to them. And then, after all that, they would then look and say, boy, you guys are in trouble. Because our God that did it then is still the same yesterday and now. Amen? And he's with us. Amen? You see, they did just the opposite of what we perhaps do. That is, I look at circumstances now and say, oh, no. Oh, God. Lord, are you awake up there? And Jesus is pacing the throne. Oh, oh. If you're going to look at the now, you're going, to, you're going to live by how you feel about now. And you're walking the Lord. It's going to be up and down, up and down. And, and your phrase will be, well, I just feel like God is showing me through circumstances. You see, God, is, has, a, God has greater ability than speak through circumstances. He can speak directly to you. We don't sit around and wait for something to happen and then try, well, is that God or the devil? Is that... That could be God. Well, no, it could be the Satan counterfeiting circumstances. You see? So we're led about by circumstances. Or we're led about by feelings. When Isaiah said, do just the opposite of that. Begin to shout for joy what God had done. And, and, and give praise to him for what he's done. Forget what's happening now. Begin to look back and give praise. Now, you know what our problem is? We don't have a diary at home somewhere on our refrigerator it has the last 15 answers to prayer that God has done for us. That's what we're missing. You know what we're missing when we come into a song service? We are not singing and thinking about the last 15 things God has done for us. And we got this blank thing kind of, and we're trying to conjure, con, kind of inher, encourage the spirit by singing those words. Okay? And you see, especially when we sing a chorus and, and everybody gets... In one meeting, it's like blessed and, oh, man, praise God. So the next service, what do we do? We bring out that chorus and sing it 45 times and kind of pump it, you know. And, and it, what happened? It worked last week. Why, why does it let me down now? You see, we, we shout and sing for joy at what God has already done and established. It's there. It's there. Listen, Satan can never take away what God has already done for you. It can, the memory of it cannot be, cannot be taken out of your experience and walk with God. You know what God has done. You know when you were up, a, up against the wall, it was impossible financially. There was no way out. And, and what happened? God sent angels and stuffed your mailbox with money. You know what I mean? <laughs> you heard me tell about the last couple of weeks I, I was praying for $500? For, for a... For a Maybe a carnal desire, but, you know, I got suits in my closet that are eight years old. You know that? That I wear on Sundays and, and stuff. And I, I've been praying that God bless me with 500 bucks. I was going to buy 
a couple of new suits and some dresses for Barb. And, uh, and I've been whining about it for a long time. I've been looking in my closet and whining. I'm looking at things are. And God said, well, what do you need and what do you want? Okay. And well, God said, well, give me a budget. Figure it out. I, all right. Figure it out. $500. There you are. $500. Like, I'll show you $500. You can't get $500 out of nowhere. Fill out my income tax, and I thought sure I was going to pay in money, so I put it off till last week. I, got, I took it to the tax guy. Tax guy fixed it up and mails it back to me. Uh, uh, employee to the church to the federal withholding uh, you're self-employed think about it and uh, and so I called the IRS explained to this lady my weird situation you ever heard anybody like me before she said yeah she gets out her tax laws and starts going through it and she says uh, is my income tax prepared right and she says no it's not prepared right you have a $557 earned income credit coming back to you I said, say that again. <clears throat> she said, $557. And I said, ma'am, what is your name? I wrote it all down, wrote her phone number down. I said, so I got my 500 bucks coming in the mail, plus the ties. <laughs> plus $7 to soap in an offer. Amen. And you say, oh, pastor, that's coincidence. Coincidence, my eye. <laughs> you come home with me and try to convince me that's coincidence. Amen? It says, shout for joy, O barren one. You have borne no child. Break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud. You who have not travailed for the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous. You see, then it goes into futuristic. It will be. Things as they are will change. Things as they are will not remain the same. Why? Because you're shouting for joy. Then he says, Thus, uh, then the sons, uh, yeah, sons of the death of the woman more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. He, what, what, how can that be? The Lord says it. That's how it can be. Are you sure? Well, the Lord, God says it. <laughs> I love it when God puts himself on the spot because he's never missed yet. There's not one promise in the book. There's not one situation God's ever spoke to you that he's blown it. Now, we know people that we've dealt business with in situations and made contractual promises and blew it. But nobody, any time, has ever caught God in that. So when he says it, man, E.F. Hutton listens. Or he should. Secondly, it says what? Verse, verse 2. Enlarge the place of your dwelling. What do we want to do? First, when it says sing for joy, instead of singing and shouting, we want to cry. When it says enlarge the place of your tent, what do we want to do? We want to hide. And it means open the place of your dwelling. Get ready for, for, for blessing. Get ready for company. Get ready to, to have a growing family. You know, uh, when the church says, you know, uh, Things are tough. We shouldn't, we shouldn't do it. It says get ready for a blessing. Enlarge, the, en, enlarge your faith. Enlarge the place in your heart for God. Enlarge, in a sense, begin to believe God for greater than what you see right now. Pull out all the stops and just throw yourself completely at the mercy of God. Lay yourself completely before Him and believe Him no matter what. And it says, spread out. It says enlarge the curtains of your dwelling. Uh, or stretch out the curtains of your dwellings, spare not, lengthen your cords. And if you understand it, you with me? We're talking about a tent now. And so we add curtains on the outside of this thing to get more room for, for kids, for family. And then it says, lengthen your cords. Why? So you get the tent a little bit higher and a little bit wider. It says, get ready for blessing. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stop confessing, oh, it's small. 
It says, begin to believe God for big. What you should do when things can't get any worse. Verse 4 is the third key that God asked us to do. What does it say? Fear not. You know, fear is the greatest and most uh, uh, consistent way Satan robs from us of the promises of God. Fear says, look what's happening. Fear says, oh no. Fear says to women, oh man, we won't make it out of this one. We'll never, we'll never get these bills paid. Fear says, oh, we can't make that move. Oh, we shouldn't do that. Oh, fear says, watch out. Fear says, caution. Fear says, what? look out. Fear says, don't do that. Fear says, think about this. Fear says, wait, 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 wait. And yes, you should have good business sense. Yes, you should know the ins and outs of everything before you commit yourself to a situation. I'm not talking about, you heard me say, charismatic check booking. That is where you don't keep a balance. You just write checks. And trust God to fill it with deposits before the checks get to the bank. No. Amen? I'm not, I'm not talking about presumption. I'm talking about it when you know that God has spoken to you and it's bigger than you ever imagined God would ask you to do. It's more than you could believe for. Friend, when it gets beyond your ability to logically figure out how it could happen, that's when you step into God's area and faith operates in that area. You see, if I can figure out how to make this church the right size on my own, figure out how all the bills are going to be, then I'm operating in my abilities, my natural trained abilities through school. But when it's bigger than I can see it, it's the evidence of things hoped for, uh, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's the realm of faith. Barbara? I got that in my notes. I was going to quote that next. Jimmy Johnson, pastor friend of ours that preached for us back in the middle school years ago, preached on fear. And he gave that very definition that Barbara quoted. And it stuck with me too, Barbara. And, you know, uh, fear is false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. It's very convincing, but it's deceptive. It's not real. It's just fear. It's Satan's smoke screen. It's Satan's di uh, distraction. Don't believe God for that. Wait, stop. It's fall, it seems very convincing. Yet if it goes against everything that God has spoken to you to that point, then it's fear. It's just fear trying to overtake you. What does the Bible say? But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Can you say amen? You'll never get anything from God or receive anything from God operating in fear. Never. Because God doesn't operate on the principle of fear. He operates on the principle of faith. Don't fear. And, and also he gives you insight into fear not for you will not be put to shame. Neither feel humiliated for you will not be disgraced. But you will forget the shame of your youth. And the, and also says, and the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. Now what he's saying, the shame of your youth too. Those presumptuous failures you had as a new believer where you thought you were jumping out in faith and really you heard a good preaching by somebody and bought that tape and ran home and just charged that glory to God because he said it, you know, and got all wound up and excited and wild and God hadn't spoke to you. You just got wound up over a teaching and you charged out in your own zeal and things bombed out. And then you come back, hey God, I did what you told me. No, you hadn't done what God told you. You just heard a good teaching and got you all excited and you charged out and tried to do it. That's inspiration. That's not revelation. And he says, but God says, forget the mistakes of your, your, your times as a new believer. And he's saying to Israel, those mistakes you made in the wilderness, forget that. God has forgiven it. Forget that. Don't remember the, the mistakes of your youth. Forget that. Forget the failures. God doesn't remember your failures. Why don't you keep bringing them up to yourself? God doesn't sit and look at Jesus. Hey, remember when so-and-so blew it? Remember when so-and-so gossiped? Remember so-and-so did this? Remember so-and-so did that? Remember so-and-so did this and this and it? They don't, they don't have that conversation on the throne. There's no record of it anywhere up there. 
So stop bringing it up to yourself. Stop bringing it up to each other. And fear says, I'm going to fail. Don't bring it up either. <laughs> That's not trust in God. Amen? So here's what you've got to do. You've got to shout for joy. Amen? You know, it's fun just to look the devil right in the face when circumstances are bad and just give him a big old grin. Praise God. Things couldn't be any tougher. Hallelujah. Now, your in-laws will think you're crazy. But they do anyway. They just hadn't told you yet. <laughs> and it, just, look, just look at the devil right now. Praise God. God's good. And you always got Job's friends. Remember Job's friends? What big sin is in your life that these things are happening? You got Job's wife. Why don't you curse God and die? And, but we got Job says, uh, for the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We're so used to anticipating God giving when he takes away. We're like, Hannah, hey, wait a minute, God, we can't be doing this. But Job says, blessed be the name of the Lord anyway. Whether I have or have not, blessed be the name of the Lord. Paul said to him, I've, I've come to the place of maturity that whatever state I'm in, he wouldn't talk about Minnesota or South Dakota, but he said, whatever condition financially I found myself to be in, whether chained to a Roman soldier or standing in a synagogue in Jerusalem preaching to my brothers, whatever state I, I, I've learned to be content. That is a complete trust in God's ability. He's looking over my life. That I don't look at the now. I look at what God has done. I look at what God has promised he will do through me. You see? If you live in the now, you live in a lot of fear, an emotional roller coaster experience. But you live in what God has done, what God has told you, and what God is going to do. And I'm telling you, you'll be a different believer. You'll have a peace on you that you didn't have before. What does the word say? In Philippians 4, verse 7, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds. You'll know when you've completely given a matter to God is when you give him the circumstance and he gives you his peace. Stay there until that transition happens. What does it say in Isaiah 61? But he'd give us a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Stay there until you come out with a garment of praise and you left behind the spirit of heaviness. You see? Stay there until it happens in God's presence because he'll do it. He'll do it. And here's what you got to do. When everything's going, couldn't get worse, what you should do. Let's go on, though, and answer the question why you should do these three things. Why you should do it. When you do these three things, you begin to set into, you set into operation spiritual principles by which God operates. You begin to, in a sense, dial heaven's abilities up. Now, let me well, we don't manipulate God. But God at the same time has given us his business card and the phone numbers are there. 24 hours, day and night. He's like a bail bondsman. He comes to bail us out, you know. He, he, he's made himself more than available. There was a guy in our church we worked at in Miami. And we never knew what to think about his business because he was a bail bondsman in Miami. And if you've ever, I've I never been around that kind of scene or knew, you know, I've never been bailed out of jail or any kind of thing. Uh, if I ever gotten, I never got in jail because I knew that my dad would not bail me out. So, um, first of all, it involved money. And secondly, it involved paying for me for something, uh, which had been no on two counts. He left me there. So, but I got to see a little bit because his son was involved in the business. His son was a, helped me in the youth group. But he wore a beeper. And this man did his bail bondsman, I mean. And we never knew what to think about it. Try, you know, and staff, staff guys behind the scenes would begin to query with each other about how to theologically discern, is this guy, is it got a, a business that Jesus would prove of? You know. Of course, you had scriptural Verses you could bring up too. You know, he came to set, set the captives free and, you know, could put that on the business card, you know. 
Uh, opens prison doors. No. Uh, but we, we're always having these kind of discussions about this guy. And I can't, can't even remember his. Uh, Whitus. Uh, Joel, Joel Whitus. Sunday night service, this beeper would go off. He'd walk out to the pay phone that they had in the church for you and make $20,000 and come back in and sit down. And every time that beeper would go off, I'd go green with envy. Because I knew he just made money, just like that, that easy, you know. But if you've ever seen or been around that aspect, and then having been involved in prison ministry and jail ministry some, um, here in the county and also on the state, state level, uh, any time around jails or prisons, or in, you go to a phone booth and the thing is plastered with stickers of bail bondsmen. Just plastered, you know, with stickers. Uh, just, just everywhere, just, you know. You ever looked in the yellow pages, bail bondsmen, you ever done that? There's a hundred of them in there. And they got the biggest ads in the whole book. And they're trying to get them all up front and jockey for position, bail bondsmen. Well, not that God is a bail bondsman, but we do get in circumstances where we do need a, a deliverer. And God has left his num phone number very plainly posted in the scriptures. There are the promises of God that if we submit to that and begin to operate in that, like in these three things, we dial these three situation numbers up, God, it puts God in operation on our behalf. And we say, well, God's not doing anything. God says you hadn't dialed up yet. We said, saying, things couldn't get any worse and God's not doing nothing. And God's saying you hadn't called up right yet. You called and you got a wrong number, but you hadn't called mine. Now, you say, well, well why does God demand that of us? Because God operates in faith and we must first take a step of faith. He requires that of us. Now, believe me, whenever we take one step of faith, God takes a million towards us. Believe me. But yet he sits in first ways for us to take that first step. Confessing our inabilities and beginning recognizing his abilities. Amen? We've got to do that. Now, forgive me if I, I don't mean to offend anybody by the illustration of bail bondsmen. I'm, you know, I sure don't like in God to that. It's, it's, to say the least, it's questionable in character, but. Uh, what I'm trying to say to you, though, is, is God has made himself more than available. And he wants us to call on him. And what happens when we do? Look at verse 5. What's God doing? I mean, I'm sorry, why you should. Why, why you should follow these three principles. Uh, for your husband is your maker. Uh, to go to anybody else, to try anything else, is like adultery. If I'm looking at the circumstances, I'm giving in to fear, God says, that's adultery. But if you come to me and begin to shout for joy, enlarge the place of your tent, and don't fear, he says, then you're coming to your husband, who is your maker. Now, you know, there, there have been times, and they're rare, but people treat my wife in a, in a negative way. And let me tell you, when I find out about it, when she lets me in, in on it, which a lot of times she doesn't because she knows, but... When I find out about it, they got trouble. Amen? Why? Because I'm her husband and she's my wife. And I love her dearly. And I'm not going to let anybody, <laughs> whether it be saint or devil, treat her with anything other than what the respect she's due as my wife. Why? Because she's God's gift to me. Now, we understand that in practical terms, don't we? Uh, for instance, you know, whether it be a door-to-door -door salesman kind of situation or someone where a car was being worked on, and they spoke harshly to her or dealt uh, deceptively with her in some way. Man, when I find out about it, I'm going to be back down there. And the guy better be looking out for his hide. Uh, because you can talk to me that way, that's one thing, but don't talk to my sweetheart. And, and listen, men, even when it comes to my kids, if they start back-talking her, I say, hey, you, you don't talk to my wife that way. Amen. <laughs> and they look at me like, who's your wife? <laughs> Amen. But God says, when you begin to do thing, th things like that, and circumstances of Satan has turned against you in circumstances, or circumstances are bad, when you call up, 
when you, when you dial up God, you're dialing up your husband. And you're saying, honey, these things down here are mistreating me. And God will be down there faster than I could, more effective than I ever will be, and madder at the devil than I'll ever get. Oh, for who? For you. Understand it well, you and I, we are the bride of Christ. And Father says, Jesus, they're messing with your bride. Ooh, man. Look out. Jesus, I just had a phone call from one of the members of your body, your bride. Someone's mistreating them. Man, I don't want to be there when when he shows up on the scene. Mm -mm. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? You are that much on the heart of God. Okay? Then he says, For your husband is your maker. Who is he? Whose name is the Lord of hosts. Somebody tell me what host means. Who are the host of heaven? Who are the host? Okay. Okay, they are the warring angels of heaven. Man, oh man. You not only got Jesus, man, at you. Your husband. Uh, those folks do, that mistreating you. But now we got the host of the angels, armies of heaven on your trail. Man, oh man, oh man. We say, well, who is your husband? Well, my husband is my maker. He knows me the best. And he's the Lord of hosts, the armies of heaven. And Satan, I've just called him up. And you're in trouble. <clears throat> is that sinking into you yet? Is that, is that coming? It gets gooder. Look to the person next to you and say, man, that was for you. Third phrase, he says, I'm not getting through this tonight. Third phrase, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. What does redeem mean? He comes and buys you out of slaving, enslaving situations. He shows up, pays the price. That's, that one's mine. I'm taking her out of this. Woo! He is, your, your husband is who? He's your maker. He who else? He's the captain of the host of the armies of heaven. Who else is he? He's your redeemer. He's the one that's got the riches to buy you out of enslaving situations. And says, no, you'll not enslave that one. That one is mine. No circumstances, you will not hold that one. That one is mine. I have redeemed that one. I have bought that with my own blood. That is my bride. I am their maker. I am their husband. That one is mine, devil. They're mine. Back off. And, and Satan looks at Jesus and he sees all them angels behind him. He looks and counts his own troops and says, guys, sound retreat. We're getting out of here. Fourth phrase, the first, fifth verse, who is called the God of all the earth. What does that mean? Man, there ain't a hole they can hide in that God hadn't made. And he'll find them out. Let me ask you tonight, what are you afraid of? Well, Pastor, I had a lot to be afraid of before I got here tonight, but man, something done happened. Well, if that's true, then God's answered my prayer for you tonight. Look at verse 6. He hadn't given up on him yet. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth when she is rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you. That was because of their disobedience. Yet when they repented, it says, In an outburst of anger I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting love... Loving kindness, I will have compassion on you. And there it is again, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Verse 16 is quite interesting in, in the theology of circumstances and situations that happen to you in my life, yours in my life. Behold, God says, I myself have created the smith who blows the fire of coals. 
Okay? He's created the smith. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm giving this to you as I understand it. Okay? There may be much more to it that I'm not aware of, but I'm giving it to you as I understand it. God may show you more and build upon it, and I hope that he does as you meditate upon it. But he says, I have created the smith who does what? He does three things. He blows the coals. That is, he's the guy that makes things hotter. <laughs> You're figuring it out now, right? What else does he do? He makes a weapon. What does your Bible say? Forges a weapon. Okay, somebody else. An instrument. And what translation is that? King James says instrument. It, it's, it's an instrument or it's a weapon that's against you. Uh, give it to me again, I'm sorry, Bessie. And I have created the destroyer for ruin. Now again, I'm not sure if this is the part I don't understand, the destroyer for ruin. Okay? However, I do understand verse 17 completely. Now, I believe he's speaking, I have created the smith. That is, I believe he's speaking of, the, I have created the author of circumstances. I have allowed the circumstances to develop. I'm aware that the circumstances are taking place. I am aware that the smith is blowing the coals, that things are getting hotter. I am aware that there's a weapon that's being forged against your life. I have created this destroyer for what? For victory against you? No, for ruin. See, I, I put it all together because I said, well, God, if I'm a believer... Why are you at least allowing this thing if you're not the author of this circumstance? Why are you allowing these things to happen? I've created the destroyer for ruin. Yes. The ravager to destroy. Uh, okay, New International Version says I've created the destroyer to work havoc and also the ravager. To destroy. Okay? I, I could be wrong. I'm just... All right? Pastor Dave, you? Nah. Once in a while. I believe he's speaking of the devil. I've created this the destroyer to work havoc, uh, to, but his end will be ruined. All right? And I backed it up by going down to verse 7, continuing with verse 17 in his context. No weapon. Where is it? No weapon that's been forged by the smith, blown hot and ready, coming out now, out of the furnace, it, uh, circumstances, it's happening, you see it happening, fear is coming on you, you see the circumstances developing, the, the weapon is in it, I see the conclusion, what's going to happen in circumstances, I draw a conclusion, if, this, if we do this, or we've already done this now, and, and oh look what's coming, that's the weapon, you see it coming out of the coals of the smith, you see it happening. And it says, no weapon that is formed against you shall what? Say it with me again. Shall prosper. Shall prosper. I, I believe in all this that God is staging a battlefield and allowing Satan just so much room in circumstances and situations in your life, he's preparing a battlefield. He's letting Satan set his, all his armies up. And then when you begin to, begin to move in the principles I gave you and shouting and enlarging and fearing not, then when, when God has allowed Satan to pull out all of his armament, all of his battle troops, then God shows up on the scene and clears the battlefield. And he says, I'm in Lord here. I'm in charge here. I'm the God here. No weapon is formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that accuses you you shall, con in judgment, you will condemn. And this is the heritage, and the inheritance of the servants of the Lord. And their vindication is from me. What's, what's he saying in the last line? I'll vindicate you. Their vin vindication is from me. I will vindicate. What does the word say? That vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. You've heard me, in, perhaps in testimony years ago, one man who brought great, 
great havoc to Barb and I's life in the ministry. So some of the most evil things of without origin, just mostly, just all suspicion. It's the most evil, complete suspicion. And uh, conjuring up in his own mind. Most evil things that were totally opposite of our nature in every way. And brought all kinds of distress and torment to my mind. Because you know how it is. After a while you listen to that, then, you, then Satan begins to convince you that you're really that way. That that's how you really are. When you know that there's something in you that God has spoken to you about that says, if you're not different, you're longing to be different, and you are changing. And I'll never forget the anger and the bitterness I began to feel for this one man. I, I, would, I would literally dream of ways of killing him. You ever been there? You ever had that much anger and hatred? Fantasy, how I could do it and, and even get away with it. And God spoke to me and says, I died for him. Release him to me and I will deal with him. Hold on to your anger and you block my ability to bring vengeance on your behalf. Release him to me. Release him to me. Perhaps there's somebody in your life right now that's created circumstances around you that's really come against you, come against your family. You know, was, was the very weapon that was forged against you and you're, and you're zeroing in the weapon. You're not doing what God told you to do. And that's sing and shout for joy and then begin to believe God for what he's promised and the future is going to happen. Instead, you're zeroing on the weapon. You're beginning to curse the, oh, that person. It's, it's bigger than that person, friend. And God's word to you is release them to Jesus. Let him deal. Oh, man. You will not believe what God will do and how he does it. Great, greater severity than you and I will ever know. Now, in my flesh... I wanted to go back years later and find out what happened to that guy. I wanted to find out how he got it in the end. But God says, you'll never know until you get to heaven. And don't go looking. Hello? Huh? What does the word say about love rejoices, does not rejoice in iniquity? Love rejoices in the truth. Love doesn't rejoice when others get it because they got it coming. <laughs> they don't gloat over that. I'm speaking to someone very specifically tonight, to you. It's, it's, friend, the warfare is bigger than an individual. Let's bow our heads. Father, I pray right now you'd convict us for times when we tried to our own numbers to call you in on the situation instead of singing and shouting for joy, believing you in faith and enlarging the place of our dwelling where you can bless us. When we gave in to fear completely, could not remember one Bible verse, one scripture, we just began to call up everybody and tell everybody what Satan's doing against them, giving in complete fear. God, forgive us. God, forgive us. But teach us tonight now, Father God. Teach us tonight. We focused in on a person or an individual that's been a weapon against our life. Father, you said no weapon, no individual that's formed against us shall prosper. Father, we entrust them to you. We've got to release them to you in Jesus' name. You deal with them as you see fit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Father, there are people in this room that They've been wondering what to do when things can't get any worse. Father, let them pick this up tonight. Let them take it home and use it in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. How many enjoyed that work? Amen. Take Isaiah home with you. Have breakfast with him one day this week. Pull out chapter 54 there and read it again. Pull out your notes. And you'll see that God, by the Holy Spirit, will begin, you, begin to show you things there that I didn't, didn't even begin to bring out to you. And you'll say, man, 
Was that God I just heard? <laughs> did I, did I, did I, it's like you read it and then, you're, then your mind, spirit begins to expand on it and it, it brings revelation to you. Amen? Praise God. Don't forget all you men, Friday night at 7 o'clock our retreat starts. And let me say this, if... Did I get that right there? Thank you. Yeah, check in between 6 and 6.45 in the hotel. If you hadn't paid your money, we need your money. Uh, I know of a couple of guys that asked me to pay it Friday, and that's fine. I, I know who they are, so don't take offense at this. If you haven't signed up yet and you'd like to go to the retreat, and it's the first time you're hearing about it, it's with Peter Lord, you still can. Also, if you just, it's impossible for you to stay overnight. Uh, you can come to the services uh, and for the morning meeting as well, but you have to pay for your own breakfast and that kind of stuff, all right? Any questions about that? Then the banquet starts Saturday night at 7 o'clock. Mission Nets is sponsoring and kind of a, uh, a, a whole church family banquet. And I understand they've got some uh, different skits involved in it that, uh, that you're going to enjoy. And uh, they won't fill me in on them. And uh, that always scares me. So if I have my eyes closed and I'm just praying in the Spirit, don't bother me, you know. Uh, no, I, I trust those Mission Net gals. They do a tremendous job. And we have over 250 people with tickets to come. So I encourage you, if you hadn't made your arrangements, you need to see one of our Mission Net leaders who's in the back here now tonight somewhere. Or help me, Bessie. One thing I, I always forget to do when I go to these retreats, if, if, or, or like what they're going to, is if there's going to be love offering, to take a check. Most people don't have money. Okay. Yeah, we will receive offerings for Peter Lord. Thank you, Bessie. So if you want to bring a check and whatever um, and do that, and uh, we'll be taking sound equipment down there and, um, and recording the meetings as well. So some of you fellows that can't, absolutely can't go, uh, uh, but anything you do, God will honor for you that, that you'd sacrifice to get there. I am guarantee you. Uh, if you're hungry and thirsty and you say no to this and this and this and you'll get there, uh, amen, ladies. You went to retreat this last weekend? Amen. Praise God. And, uh, you know, God will honor it. And, uh, and I trust you'll be there and join us. But then the mission at banquet, 6 o'clock Saturday night. Audrey? We have all the men to bring every table down. Don't set them up. Just put them down here. Yeah. Thank you, Audrey. I, From upstairs, we need Yes. Um, what we need right now, if I can have about six or eight men, and this will go real quick, uh, Dottie was going to do this herself, her and her mother who's retired, was going to do this themselves. And I said, no, you won't. And she says, but pastor, we can do it. And I have to do this every now and then. I said, Dottie, you need to read the name on that door right there. And it says, Pastor Dave, I'm the boss. We'll do it my way, especially on this one, okay? And so I will help you, Dottie. And so I took it on myself. Thank you for reminding me, Audrey. Uh, if I have about six or eight guys right now, all we need to do is bring the tables in here and just uh, kind of set them in rows right here and then they'll move the chairs around. And uh, really what we've got to do is clear all the chairs out of the middle, and then we'll have, like, tables set all the way down, and they'll leave the middle open for some the skits and music and those kind of things that they're doing, the fun things. So could I have about six or eight guys that volunteer real quick? And I promise I'm going to hold you more than 15 minutes. Okay? Praise the Lord. Right now. Okay. I'll do it. All right. Praise God. Amen. And uh, 